The Purloining of Ruth Allen by Elizabeth Flint Wade. Puckerville is the name of a little village in New York State, snuggled at the bottom of a deep valley, as if hiding from curious eyes. The road leading to it comes down a steep hill, winds in and out among the houses, and finding nothing of importance to warrant its staying, scampers up the hill on the opposite side and is lost to sight over the top. Viewed from either hill, the road might easily be regarded as a mammoth puckering string which drew the houses together and held them in a tight bunch, hence the name Puckerville. Halfway up the hill south of the village stood a small story and a half cottage. This tiny house with its acre of ground was known as the Old Barber Place and was the home of two maiden sisters, Ruth Allen and Thankful Barber. The two women had a small income, to which each added according to her strength and talent. Thankful was a large framed woman, strong and masterful, and took the entire management of the place upon herself. She diligently cultivated the acre of ground, and from it supplied the villagers with cabbage and tomato plants in the spring, vegetables and fruit in the summer, and seed cucumbers, cauliflowers, and radish pods for their fall pickling. Ruth Allen was the elder, but as she was a small, delicate woman and slightly lame from a hurt in her babyhood, she was regarded by her more robust sister as little more than a child, and looked after and admonished accordingly. Ruth Allen, she was always called Ruth Allen, being a most unassuming body, never questioned Thankful's ways but meekly submitted to her discipline even in the matter of the gowns she wore and the food she ate. Ruth Allen did tailoring for the village mothers, making over the garments of the elder male members of the family, for the younger cleaning, piecing, and pressing, till they looked as good as new. Now Ruth Allen said thankful as they rose from the breakfast table one bright June morning, you set right down and finish them pants of Jaime Gaskell's for I told his mother Sunday she could have them tonight, and you'll have to work spry to get them done. I've got all I can lay my hand to this morning with hanging out the clothes and killing bugs and the cowcumbers. Beats all how a rainy Monday puts everything behind hand. I did think I'd take a little walk round the garden before I begun sewing, said Ruth Allen. It would kind of freshen me up a bit. I didn't sleep very well last night. Nonsense, cried Thankful. You slept all night as good as I did, and you ain't no business traipsing around the garden this wet morning either. Like's not you'd step on something and spile it. Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do, and feet too for that matter. Ruth Allen took her word and sat down by the kitchen window, but she could not suppress a sigh as she looked out on the dewy freshness of the garden. Thankful bustled about, washing the breakfast dishes, then drawing a tub of clothes from under the table, began to wring them out. The window by which Ruth Allen was sitting overlooked the village, and she glanced out now and then. You'll get your clothes out before anyone in the village, she said as Thankful took up her basket. There ain't anybody got theirs out, not even the widow Filkins. You better be tending to your work instead of watching the neighbors, was all the reply that Thankful vouchsafed. Thus rebuked, Ruth Allen plied her needle so industriously that Jaime Gaskell was in a fair way to get his trousers before the time promised. Thankful's washing was soon swinging on the line. It's a powerful hot morning, she said as she came back into the kitchen. You ought to be thankful you can sit here where it's cool instead of breaking your back over striped bugs in the hot sun. Yes, I know, but I ain't thankful. I'm just Ruth Allen. This was Ruth Allen's only joke. Thankful tied on her gingham sunbonnet, preparatory to her raid on the ill-fated striped bugs. I wish you'd come look down in the village, said Ruth Allen. There ain't a living soul got any clothes out, and there's lots of folks in the street. I wonder what's happened. Thankful came to the window, but it was to examine the progress Ruth Allen was making on the nether garments of Jaime Gaskell. 
Now, if you don't tend to your work, you'll go and set in the shed door, she said. You ain't set two dozen stitches this morning. This was a situation not at all desirable, so Ruth Allen sewed swiftly, but her thoughts were busy with the possible happenings in the village. What could be the matter? Something startling or the widow Philkins would never have neglected her washing. By and by, her curiosity got the better of her discretion. Seeing Thankful down on her knees among the cucumber hills, apparently oblivious to everything except the wholesale slaughter of her garden enemies, she laid down her work and stole softly into the keeping room, where from the secretary she took an old spyglass that had been her father's. She hurried back. Thankful was still bending over the cucumbers. She had not been missed. In her fear of being discovered by Thankful, it was some time before she could adjust the glass to her vision. Sakes alive, she said as soon as she could see clearly. Something has happened, sure. The widow Filkin's yard is full of folks. Looks if everybody in the village was there. There's a team stopping at the gate. It's the constable, sure as I'm alive. He's getting out and going in. My, how I wish I could hear what they're talking about. Goodness, here comes another, a stranger. I wonder. So engrossed had she become with the exciting scene, she quite forgot to watch for Thankful. She was suddenly reminded of her by having the glass taken away and hearing a stern voice say, Ruth Allen Barber, I'm just as ashamed of you as I can be. What do you mean by spying on the neighbors with a glass? I have to watch you more than I would a child. You take your work and go sit in the shed door. Ruth Allen said not a word, but humbly obeyed. Thankful locked the glass into the secretary and put the key in her pocket. Then she went back to her gardening. I've got the pants most done, said Ruth Allen when Thankful came in to get the dinner. Is Miss Gaskell coming after him, or have we got to take them down there? She's coming after him, replied Thankful. I'll set on an iron so I can press him right after dinner. The simple meal was soon prepared, and the two women sat down to their dinner. They did not linger over it, but ate as a matter of duty. Thankful finished first, and rose without ceremony, brought out the press board, and began pressing the trousers. Her back was toward Ruth Allen. Suddenly she turned around and looked at her. You was telling fortunes, Ruth Allen. Don't deny it. There's the tea grounds in the saucer. A body would think you were fifteen instead of nigh fifty. I ain't but forty-one come August, said poor Ruth Allen. I wasn't telling fortunes either. I was seeing if I'd get my wish. If wishes were fishes, we'd have some fried instead of eating salt pork half the year. Now soon's I clear off the table, I'll bring down that old lilac muslin of yours, and you can rip it up. I want to make a new tack, and that'll do for the cover. Oh dear, cried Ruth Allen, you ain't gonna cut that up. I want to keep it. What for, I'd like to know. You're too old to wear such a dress, and it might be doing us some good if twas made into a tack. I wanted to keep it, cause twas the last dress mob bought me. Now if Thankful had a soft spot in her heart, it was for the memory of her mother, and with a short, keep it then, she turned to her work. After the dishes were washed, they exchanged their dark cotton gowns for stiffly starched ginghams, and sat down to sew in their tidy kitchen. They would have thought it immodest to sit out in the cool shade of the mammoth elm that spread its green umbrella over their front yard. The long June afternoon wore away. They sewed diligently and talked a little. Thankful's thoughts were on her work, but Ruth Allen's were strained back into her girlhood days, lured there by the sight of the stranger who had been the last she saw enter Widow Filkin's gate. He had somehow reminded her of her one lover, Jason Chadwick. Indeed, in every gathering of men, she was sure to see someone who reminded her of him and she was living over again the delightful days which had ended so suddenly. When Jason Chadwick had won her promise to be his wife, she had added to her softly whispered, Yes, if Providence is willing. If Providence was willing, Thankful was not, 
and while Ruth Allen wavered between her love for Jason and her fear of disobeying Thankful, Jason grew angry and left Puggerville. He had never returned, and Thankful was sure that the fire of love that had burned so fiercely in Ruth Allen's heart had long ago turned to ashes. She was mistaken. The coals were there, and the slightest breath from the olden days was sufficient to kindle them into flame. But Thankful never saw their glow. When Thankful was watering her celery after supper, Mrs. Gaskill came through the gate. My, but it's warm, she said, sitting down in the door and fanning herself with her sunbonnet. I'm clean tuckered out, climbing that hill, but it's nice and cool up here. Have you heard the happening down in the village? No, said Ruth Allen, coming to the door. Is anybody dead? Worse than that, said Mrs. Gaskill. Folks has got to die, but they ain't got to be robbed. Somebody broke into Widow Filkin's house last night and stole her silver spoons and her mother's old silver candlesticks and four dollars in money. Goodness me, cried Thankful, setting down her watering pot. You don't mean to say that robbers have been in Puckerville. There won't be no safety sleeping nights after this. How did they get in? Took a ladder and climbed up the back chamber window. The money was under a hollow chiny dog on the front mantel. The spoons was sewed up in her best feather bed, and the bed was cut open, and the room's just full of feathers flying around everywhere. I don't believe she'll get them feathers cleaned up all summer. Have they catched the robbers? No, they got away, for they never found the things had been stolen till this morning. I tell you, we ain't none of us safe now. You'll have to keep locked up pretty tight living here alone as you do. And what do you think? Jason Chadwick's just come back in... Ruth Allen, said Thankful quickly. You go down cellar and fetch up a bottle of that current shrub for Miss Gaskill. She's so head up, twill be coolin' for her. Don't say anything about him before Ruth Allen, said Thankful as soon as her sister was out of hearing. You don't mean she's hankering after him yet? I don't mean anything, said Thankful with dignity. But I don't want Ruth Allen to go thinking of those old times. I didn't mean she should know he was here and... Yes, she said as Ruth Allen came in with the current shrub. I'm free to confess if there's one thing I'm afraid of more than fire, it's burglars. When I've read of folks being robbed and murdered in their beds in the city, I've always been thankful that I lived where there was nothing to molest or make me afraid. But now I shan't take a mite of comfort till that robber's catched and shut up. I ain't a bit afraid of their coming here, said Ruth Allen. We have nothing they'd want to steal. Oh, Ruth Allen, they're just as likely to come here as anywhere, and more too, seeing we're alone. If they didn't find anything to steal, they'd murder us in our beds, and then how do you feel, I'd like to know. Not having had any experience in that line, Ruth Allen was not able to describe her possible sensations. Seems to me, if I was gonna steal anything from you, said Mrs. Gaskill, it'd be your current shrub. It's proper good, the best I ever drank. As soon as Mrs. Gaskill went away, Thankful closed the windows and drew the curtains. What makes you shut up so early? said Ruth Allen. And I never knew you to draw the curtains till we went to bed. Well, I ain't gonna have any bloodthirsty villains peeking in the windows at us, and I'm gonna lock the doors now too. I'd just as soon sleep with the doors and windows both open. Them that know nothing fear nothing, I've always heard say, returned Thankful pushing the bolt of the kitchen door into its socket. The kitchen was hot and close, and Ruth Allen was glad when the clock struck nine. Thankful took the candle and went upstairs. I declare, Ruth Allen, she cried, stopping short at the top. If I didn't forget all about shutting these chamber windows, there may be forty robbers in here for all we know, and she peered timidly into the dark rooms where the flickering candle cast strange shadows. Let me come, said Ruth Allen. I ain't afraid. Nobody'd carry off an old woman like me. I ain't worrying about your getting carried off, said Thankful. But there's Pa's silver watch and Ma's cameo breastpin. They'd take them in a minute. A diligent search failed to unearth any intruder, and Thankful turned to shut the windows. 
We'll smother if you shut the windows, said Ruth Allen. I'd rather smother than be murdered, said Thankful, as she shoved the nails into the little holes over the lower sash. It was a very warm night, and Ruth Allen, never a good sleeper, tossed and turned on her bed. If she fell into a light slumber, it was only to be aroused by Thankful's whisper. What's that, Ruth Allen? I'm sure I heard something. A few nights of this wakefulness began to tell on Ruth Allen, and robust Thankful confessed that she felt kinda piqued herself. I tell you what is, said she. We'll both be down sick if we don't get our sleep. I know it, replied Ruth Allen. I don't rest hardly any nights, but I could if you'd have the windows open and not keep waking me up. Well, I can't sleep, said Thankful, just as long as that robber is roaming free, but I've thought of a way so we can both get our sleep. One of us can sleep daytimes and sit up nights. It can't be me, for I've got the garden to tend to, so it'll have to be you. When it comes 9 o'clock, you can go to bed and sleep all day and get up about supper time. I'll have supper ready and that'll be your breakfast. Then I'll go to bed at night and you can sit up and sew and keep watch. If burglars see a light burning, then they won't come near the house. Why not leave the light burning and both go to bed? Yes, and waste candles and maybe set the house to fire. Ruth Allen, there's no knowing what you'd do if I didn't look after you. I can't sleep till that robber's catched, and till they do catch him, you've got to sit up nights. Ruth Allen, with the meekness born of a long submission to a stronger will, gave up, as she always did. That morning at 9 o'clock, she went upstairs to bed. For a long time, she lay looking out on the clover-covered hillside, listening to the steady hum of the bees as they rifled the crimson blossoms. It's most wicked to go to bed in the daytime, she thought, and I can't sleep, I know I can't. But even as she made this mental protest, she drifted into dreamland, where she was once more a girl while the hum of the bees was transformed into a voice she had known and loved. She slept till after five o'clock. When she went downstairs, Thankful was pouring hot water in the teapot. A plate of cream toast and a dish of baked potatoes sat on the hearth. I'm just putting the tea to draw, she said. As soon as it's done, your breakfast will be ready. When they sat down to the table, Thankful drank a cup of tea and ate a piece of bread. It ain't my breakfast time, she said when her sister asked her why she did not eat some of the toast. Ruth Allen felt as if her world was turning around the wrong way. At 9 o'clock, Thankful went to bed and left Ruth Allen to her watch. The next morning, she said she had slept like a top. In a few days, the excitement of the robbery subsided, but Thankful would not consent to any change in their sleeping arrangements. There was no knowing when that robber might take a notion to come back, and she felt as safe as a bank with Ruth Allen keeping watch, she said. Thankful had another reason for keeping Ruth Allen in bed daytimes. Jason Chadwick had been to the house and asked to see her, but though Thankful told him that her sister would have nothing to say to him, she had caught a glimpse of him two or three times strolling in the field below the house. He shan't see Ruth Allen if I can help it, she said fiercely, and the best way to avoid a meeting between the two seemed to be to keep Ruth Allen in bed daytimes till Jason should leave town. Ruth Allen really enjoyed her nightly vigils. For the first time in her life, she had a taste of freedom. Thankful slept soundly, as was attested by her cheerful snore, and as soon as Ruth Allen heard it, she opened the doors and windows and let in the sweet night air. She hurried through the stent which Thankful always set her, and spent the rest of the time in whatever way pleased her fancy. The moon was at its full, and she wandered through the garden, stooping now and then to caress the blossoms or pass her hands softly over the dewy leaves. Thankful always reproved her for touching the plants. She'd spiral them handling them, she said. Sometimes she pulled down her hair and waved it a little on her forehead and coiled it in a loose knot the way she had worn it when a girl. Jason used to call my hair his golden fleece. It will soon be a silver fleece, she said to herself as she drew her comb through it. July had come and the weather was unusually warm. 
The nights were not much cooler than the days. One afternoon, Ruth Allen came downstairs dressed in her lilac muslin. What you got that on for, said Thankful. Because it's so hot, said Ruth Allen. There won't anybody see me. I don't have many callers. The night was very warm. Just as the sky began to grow light in the east, Ruth Allen blew out her candle and went down the walk to the gate. I've got a good mind to go up to the Alder Spring and get a drink. Thankful won't be up for an hour yet. She opened the gate and went up the hill. As she went, she pulled two or three late wild roses and stuck them in her dress. The Alder Spring, so called because a great clump of alders grew close by it, was near the top of the hill. There was a trail for horses might drink, but in order to reach it, one must make a slight detour from the main road. Ruth Allen made a cup of her hands and filled it at the stream that ran into the trough. She dabbled the cool water on her face. She had not been to the spring in a long time. It was here that she had parted from Jason, and the voice of the gurgling spring spoke only sad words to her. She leaned over and looked at her dim reflection, then started back quickly, for she thought she saw two faces in the liquid mirror. All at once, she heard the faint sound of hoofbeats. It's probably old Mr. Purdy on his way to town, she thought. He lives so far back on the hills, he has to get up in the middle of the night to go anywhere. I hope he won't see me. He won't unless he turns off to water, and taint likely. Yes, he is coming. What'll I do? She shrank back among the alder bushes. The horseman drew rein at the spring, and the horse plunged his nose into the water. He can't see me unless he turns clear round, thought Ruth Allen. She was standing on a little clump of grass that grew in the side of the hill. All at once, she felt it giving way. She made a frantic effort to save herself, but the branch to which she clung cracked with her weight. She slipped from her hiding place. The horseman looked around. It was not Mr. Purdy. It was the stranger whom she had seen at Widow Filkin's gate on the day of the robbery. Ruth Allen, Ruth Allen, cried a familiar voice. She gazed bewildered. Who is the spirited stranger? Ruth Allen, don't you know me? Is it... It's Jason. Yes, it's Jason, Ruth Allen. I've stayed round over a month trying to get a glimpse of you. I've been back twice since I left you, and both times Thankful has told me you wouldn't so much as look at me. Ruth Allen, I've come back once more after you. Can you forgive and... Ruth Allen, Ruth Allen Barber, come here to me this minute. Ruth Allen stopped with her hand half extended toward her lover. Thankful was swiftly coming up the hill. Is it to be me or Thankful? demanded Jason, reaching down and clasping her hand. Ruth Allen gave one frightened glance over her shoulder, but her nights of freedom had had their effect. You, Jason, she said faintly. Jason leaned from his saddle and lifted the late form of Ruth Allen and set her before him on the horse. Then he turned back the road whence he had come. I'd rather twould have been Pa Silver Watch, said Thankful as she saw them disappear over the top of the hill.